We believe that you are strong by design and you were made in God's image to have a strong body, mind, and spirit. You're listening to the number one strength and health authority podcast in the world. So let's get ready to unlock your potential and transform your life in today's episode. Hello there and welcome to another episode of the Strong by Design podcast show. Thank you so much for joining us today. This is Coach Chris Wilson. I'm hosting this very special episode, something a little different. If you're new to our show, then you're in for a real treat. And if you are a uh, return listener, this is something that uh, we have not done before. We're actually grabbing some of our best episodes and giving you what we feel are some of the, the strongest, most compelling conversations that we've had. This one is obviously faith-based, and uh, we just couldn't be happier with, you know, we've had so many terrific guests over the years. Uh, these are just three of some of the amazing conversations that we've had. And so I'm excited just to get right to it and give you just the best of what these episodes had to offer. The first episode is Step Into the Fear. Greatness Awaits, featuring Erwin McManus, who is a pastor of Mosaic Church out west, and uh, a wonderful man, such a big heart for God, for having a relationship with Jesus. Um, his points in this uh, uh, are, are absolutely fantastic, and they'll stick with you for a while. He talks about choosing to see the beauty around you, stepping into your greatness and your calling, um, finding hope in every day. And so it's just mindset shifts and, and it's just fantastic and uh, just love this man's heart. So you're in for a real treat with Erwin McManus. There's someone I really love and believe in, but they're, they've been so depressed that every story they tell is a negative story. It could be a negative story from the press, a negative story from social media, a negative story from their life. And so I just basically call them out on it every time. I go, okay, look at you. You just went right to a negative story. Thanks, every doubter. Yeah. No, and let's talk about something positive. And yeah, I want you to tell me a positive story. We're going to talk about something that's happening in the world that's good. And, and within three or four minutes, they'll move to a negative story. Right. And what you realize is your, your brain is lazy. And, and neuroscience will tell you this. Your brain is lazy, and it always moves to its lowest level of thinking. And so you have these brain ruts. And you have to get out of these ruts by creating new pathways. And if every day you'll find something beautiful in your life, if every day you'll find something extraordinary, if every day you'll find something that's positive, if every day you'll, you'll tell a story to yourself and to others of the good in the world, you'll retrain your brain. You'll tell your brain you're not allowed to be lazy and spend time in the dark spaces. You always have to move toward the light. And those are just some things, Samantha, that I would encourage people to do. Yeah, it's got to so be good. a conscious, a conscious decision and effort to do yeah. this because in, the, in your book, you say that we have 60,000 thoughts per day and 80% of those are naturally negative thoughts. So it's that filter that we're running it through. We have to make an effort. Okay, absolutely. And, and I made a decision and this was probably before I actually came into a life changing relationship with Jesus. You know, anyone who knows me well knows that my life is completely affected and impacted by the person of Jesus. And, but, I, but before I actually came to faith, um, I had to struggle with the depression and the sense of despair in my soul. And I don't know if I would have survived long enough to come to Jesus and if I had to found a couple of, of um, techniques. And one of the things that I did before I came to faith is I told myself, I realized I, my whole story is four or five negative stories. My entire identity is remembering four or five negative experiences over and over and over again. Mm -hmm. And so I reframed my past by looking for four or five positive experiences in my past and that I could actually begin to rebuild my own personal identity. The second thing I did is I trained myself to look for beauty every day. And it's funny now, you know, my, 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 my daughter's 28, Mariah, my son's 32, Aaron, and They'll joke. In fact, yesterday, my daughter was joking about how I, I had this compulsion for pointing out beauty all the time to everyone. And, and it's because when you're depressed, you are blind to the beautiful. And when you see beauty, you become um, numb to the depression. It's like the depression just begins to disappear. 
And so I began when I was young to identify beauty all around me. And I think it's part of what ended up turning me into an artist is because I just saw beauty everywhere and I wanted to be part of that creative process. And so I'd say to people, it's two things, choose the memories that you build your identity on. Second, choose what you see every day and make sure you see beauty all around you. And, and, and then this whole Christian thing, I don't know how many people who are Christians that listen to you, but it drives me crazy. I didn't grow up in faith. I didn't grow up in the church. I think so much of Christian thinking is so paralyzing yeah. and, uh, and numbing. When you, 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 if you think that God's will for your life is proven by the lack of pain and struggle and suffering, you've missed the whole point. Mm-hmm. Says there will be trouble in this life. We're guaranteed that. Yeah. And, and, and even if it's God's dream for your life and God's call for your life and God's destiny, whatever language you want, it doesn't mean that destiny, that calling and that dream doesn't come without a cost. God doesn't eliminate the cost and the sacrifice necessary to accomplish what he created you to do. He created you to step into that pain and rise above it. Now, I have never found competitiveness as good material for being arrogant. Because just because you're competitive doesn't mean you're any good. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's true. That's true. <laughs> but, but Christians do attribute it to the lack of humility. And, uh, and, and to me, we, we confuse humility with a lack of responsibility. And, you know, you, you need to take ownership of whatever God-given gifts and talents and intelligence that God has given you. That's not arrogance or humility. That's just responsibility and um, and you know and so I, I think that the conversation about competition is a very unique one I am I'm super competitive but not against people I'm competitive against myself mm-hmm. and and I, I, I and I love to compete against people who are better than me because that's the only time you're really competing and and so I always find any arena where I can find someone better than me and um, and I and I always accept, I tell myself, you're going to lose for a while. It's the only way to get good. It's the only way to get better than them is to lose to them. I consider losing to another person, that person passing on their greatness to me. Nobody look at it. When I lose to someone better than me, they are actually transmitting their greatness to me. And if I'm willing to absorb the learning of the failure, I'm going to get better and better and better. And, um, because I'm, I'm a lifelong learner. And I think that's the one thing that's kind of set me apart uh, from other people I grew up with was that I just never stopped learning. And, uh, um, and, and because of that, I never stopped growing and I never stopped developing. And, and, I, and as long as I'm here, I'm gonna keep improving as a human being. I think you need to be competitive against who you are right now. You need to be competitive against who you were last week, last month, last year. And, uh, and then just, Find ways to keep refining, be a better writer, be a better speaker, be a better leader, be a better husband, be a better father. Just keep refining whatever you've been entrusted to and realize that that's the best approach toward competition, that that's the drive toward greatness. You know, when um, years and years ago, I, I, I was a writer. I mean, I'm a writer again, but I stopped, I stopped writing and speaking for about five or six years in the public arena. Uh, mostly because um, my son was having a really difficult time in um, Christianity can be an incredibly uh, vitriol and unkind space. And, and it was having a really negative impact on my son. So I wanted to disappear from that world so that he didn't have to deal with the consequences of being the son of a, of a well-known pastor. And so I stopped writing books. And at that time I was fairly um, successful and one day my, my daughter, we're driving home and she says, she was younger. She goes, daddy, can I ask you a question? I said, yeah. She goes, are you famous? And, uh, and I said, why would you ask that? She goes, I, I don't know. I just, there's always people wanting you to sign things and, and meet you. Are you, are you, are you, are you, I just want to know, are you famous? And I said, why does that matter? She goes, it didn't matter. I just, but if you're famous and I'm your daughter, I should know. And, uh, and, and cause we never talked about that in our home ever. And, uh, and I looked at her and I, and I thought about it for a second. And I said, at that time, I think there was like 5 billion people in the world. And I said, sweetie, there are, there are 5 billion people on this planet and 4.9 of them have no idea I exist. 
so I'm not very famous. He goes, okay, that's all right. I just want to know. And I, I think some of us are just famous in our own minds. <laughs> you know, like we're famous in our small little world, so we feel super famous. And I, I, I think a hundred years from now, um, our, our fame will matter in that sense. Like if someone's still talking about something we said or talking about something we wrote or talking about something we did, then maybe that fame matters. It's still affecting the world. But you know, the thing that matters is like if your kids tell their kids about what an amazing human being you were. I think what's happened across our nation is that people thought, okay, we're gonna flatten the curve so I can make it through that. Okay, okay, wait a minute, okay. We're gonna flatten the curve twice. So I'm gonna make it through that. Well, okay, okay, wait a minute, all right. We're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna hold our breath until we make sure that the hospitals are not overrun. Oh, no, okay, wait a minute. We're gonna hold our breath until, you know, um, there's a vaccine. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, and what's happening is that people are holding their breath and holding their breath, but the surface line keeps changing. Yeah. So what I'm saying to you is what you're experiencing is what a proverb says. It says, hope deferred makes a heart sick. So every time you had the hope that it was gonna end and it didn't, it actually made your soul sick. You were experiencing exactly what the scripture says. Hope deferred makes a heart sick. And so stop building your hope on when it's gonna be over, or you're gonna give yourself the potential to keep getting more sick. Start putting your hope in on creating a life right now that's worth getting up for every single day. Okay, so if you're out of work right now, go, did you ever think you'd have a paid vacation? (laughs) <laughs> you know, if, if, if you're going, I'm stuck. Did you ever think you would have time to read those books? Did you ever think you would have the time to lose that weight? Did you ever think you would have the time to spend with your family? And uh, so s- stop looking at what you've lost and start paying attention to what you've gained and start focusing on what you're getting that you would have never gotten otherwise. And that's what I would say to do right now. Don't put your hope in when the government says, now we can go back to life as usual, because you the surface is gonna keep changing. Our team would like to thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. And if you're enjoying today's show, please share this episode with at least one friend or family member who will benefit from this message. And please subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Go to strongbydesignpodcast.com. That's strongbydesignpodcast.com. Let's get back to the show. Irwin never fails to deliver. And he, he gives you those goosebump moments. Uh, what, a, what an amazing, amazing man. We are excited to have him back on the show to talk about his new book uh, very soon. So the next episode that you're going to listen to is how to hear God's voice with Joe Lagalbo. And Joe is a close friend of ours. Uh, He's a copywriter. Um, He's been in the the fitness and health space for a long, long time. Uh, Just a a terrific man. Uh, And he talks about having a relationship with God, hearing from God, uh, having a conversation. And, you know, God, God is your friend, and he's somebody that you want to ha- be in daily conversation with. But, you know, he talks about the struggles of life, uh, and those are real, but God's always there for you. So get ready for a terrific conversation with Mr. Joe Legalbo. One of the things that I love to do is to journal, and the reason why is Satan likes to come in and make you forget all of the things that you're asking God for and all of the confirmations that he's giving you as well. So Satan can very much, he attacks the mind, right? He fills our mind with worries. Uh, It totally distracts us. We forget some of the things that we're asking God for. How I like to do it is I like to write down, if I have a question for God and I'm looking for wisdom from, from Holy Spirit, I'll write down the question and I'll wait 
Um, I'll give you another example here, which is really cool. So when it came to the copywriting agency, for example, I just, I didn't know if this was just an idea, if this was something I should pursue. I already have an online fitness business that I, I love putting my time and energy into. However, I felt a prompting as well to start up a copywriting agency. And so I wrote in my journal, God, do you want me to start this copywriting agency? Okay. It was that simple. And, and I did that in my, my little God time, so to speak. 10 minutes later, I get a phone call from a buddy. He knows I'm a copywriter, but he doesn't know anything other than that. And he said, he's not in the fitness space. He's not, he, he works in construction. And he said, you know what, Joe, I just have this feeling that you are supposed to get other writers you underneath you, multiply yourself, have more of you writing other people's sales letters. So get a team, get a team of writers and start growing an agency is the direction that he went with this conversation. And that was the confirmation that I needed from the Lord. And he does that over and over again. I have three journals. Yeah, but they, I mean, they were full and this was like long letters. Yeah. This wasn't like bullet point questions. I mean. Right. And a lot of these long letters that are in there, because I have three journals that are basically packed to the, you know, all the way from head to toe with with just these things about what the Lord's doing in my life. Not all of them are questions. A lot of them are also words that I've received. So after writing that question, there's no doubt that my journal is then filled with confirmations of starting this copywriting agency, just like it was when I was starting my fitness business. You know, I was asking questions and I would receive words when it was hard. And I was saying, God, is this for me? Am I supposed to be doing this? Am I going down the right track? But my wife and I were living in her mother-in-law's house. We barely have two pennies to rub together. I feel like I'm failing as a husband. You know, I'm a 26 year old newlywed. And here we are in this closet sized room in a 600 square foot home in her mother-in-law's house, my wife's uh, mother's house. And, and the Lord would answer me by having people in my life far removed that I haven't spoken to in years text me, hey, Joe, I see what you're doing and you're going down the right path. Keep running toward it. Things like yeah, that. That's cool. And I would write those down in my journal. So a lot of the things that are in my journal are just confirmations to that. A, a lot of things I write down in my journal are just praises of what God has done and just looking at, wow, God, this was such a, a question mark in my life and I'm and, and just seeing what he's done. And I can look back at every single one of those journal entries. They go all the way back to before I was married and, and even praying about my wife. Okay. <laughs> they go all the way back to then too and look at the faithfulness of God. And so when the enemy wants to tempt me and make me think that that I'm I'm in this alone, that I'm trying to figure it out alone and that good luck, Joe, and try not to mess it up, that there is a God on my side who is for me and he is speaking to me. And I just I want to be aware of it. There is going to be things that come into our lives that try and redirect us, that try and, and reroute us, bring fear in our lives. Even the, even when we're following the will of God, it's still going to be hard. Look at Jesus he, the will of God for the world was to save us. So he had to send his son to die on the cross for us. That was God's will. And here's Jesus, his son, who has to die on the cross, the, the most brutal death of all, so that his will can be fulfilled. Thankfully, none of us have to go to the cross for the sins of the world. But in order to achieve our destiny for our lives that he has planned for us, that he's set for us before the beginning of time, we're going to go through some sort of struggle and some sort of hardship to get there. And please know that it is okay for that to happen. It's okay for there to be struggle. Um, and, and the worst thing that you can do is take struggle as God saying, this is not for you. Or taking it always as a punishment, which I did something wrong, so now God's punishing me. 
Exactly. You can have storms in your life. We did another episode on this, why God sent storms. And you could go through something not very pleasant just so that you can minister to other people later that are going through that. And God can use you to love them and help them through a difficult time. I mean, that could be one reason something tough happens in your life. It also can build character in you and make you more like Jesus to prepare you for the next part of your life, the next part of what God has planned for you. Maybe you're not ready right now and he's got big plans for you. You got to go through a couple hardships to prepare you for the next thing. He's always working. So it's, we like to think that God is doing so much in maybe other people's lives or some of us may not feel like why, like you mentioned earlier, why are we important? Why, why would he want to intervene in my life? And again, it all just comes back to that principle of he's already showed that he wants to be a part of your life when he sent his son Jesus to die on the cross. He's already made the decision that he loves you even before you've come onto planet Earth. Okay, and before, you know, you came out of your mother's womb, he's already decided that he wants to have a relationship with you. The question is, do you want to have a relationship with him and not just a, a you know, Jesus, I accept you in, into my life as my savior. But do you want to have a relationship that goes beyond that? Do you want to experience all of me? And, and that's the kind of relationship that I want to have with the Lord. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. To help our show reach more listeners just like you, please let us know how we've changed your life by leaving a five-star rating and review on iTunes. Go to strongbydesignpodcast.com. That's strongbydesignpodcast.com. Let's get back to the show. Wow, Joe, that was fantastic. What a powerful message from him. Now we're going to go into an episode, Stealing from God, with Dr. Frank Turek from Cross-Examined. He's a personal, personal favorite of mine. I've been following him for years, listening to his podcast, reading his books. Uh, Talk about a guy with just so much enthusiasm and passion for what he does. And um, he's going to be talking about receiving the gift of God's love He's going to be talking about miracles and about the resurrection itself. And so get get ready for Dr. Frank Turek, who has now been on the show a few times. Because in Christianity, your identity is not on how, how many Facebook or Instagram followers you have or how many people Snapchat you. Your identity is not your sexual orientation or your sexual preference or your political party or your race or your ethnic group or your bank account or your vocation or your school or your family or any of these things. Your identity, you do not achieve. You don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. John, who wrote a lot of the New Testament and was an eyewitness of Jesus, said that God has given us the right to become children of God by receiving what Christ has done. So your achievements don't make you a better Christian or put you in a better light with God. God is an infinite being. He loves you infinitely already. There's nothing you can do that'll make him love you more or anything you can do that'll make you love you less. You don't achieve your identity. You receive your identity. And that's freeing for people who are anxious or feel anxiety or depression because I'm not, they're not quite as good as other people. They don't quite look as good as other people. They don't have many, as many friends as other people. They're not having as good a time. They don't have as much money as other people. In Christianity, none of that ultimately is the issue. What the issue is, is have you received the gift that Christ has provided for you? You can't achieve it. You can only receive it. People have trouble believing miracles because they've never seen one. Right. Um, but that's not a good reason to disbelieve in miracles because you believe in a lot of things you've never seen, right? I mean, you believe in the laws of logic. Have you ever seen those? No, you're using them right now. You believe in your mind. Have you ever seen it? No, you're using it right now. You believe in justice. You've never seen justice. You may have seen justice done, but justice is not a physical thing. It's not something you see. It's an immaterial reality, yet you believe in it. You believe in George Washington, right? Never seen him, but you believe in him. Why? Because effects have been left behind, which are best explained by a cause known as George Washington. 
In other words, we reason from effect back to cause, and that's what we do with God. We don't see God directly. We reason from effect back to cause. And so we see a creation. We know there must be a creator. The effect is creation. The cause is the creator. We have a moral law written on our hearts. We know there must be a moral law giver. The effect is the moral law. The cause is God. We, uh, we see design in the universe and design in life. There must be a designer. We're reasoning from effect to cause. And if miracles did occur, you shouldn't expect to see a lot of them. Why? Because miracles, by definition, are rare events that stand out against the backdrop of regular events. We wouldn't, we wouldn't um, be able to know whether somebody speaks for God without miracles. That's how God communicates that somebody speaks for God. Like, he, why are people going to listen to Moses? Because Moses can do miracles. Why are people going to listen to Elijah and Elijah? Because they can do miracles. Why are people going to listen to Jesus and the apostles? Because they can do miracles. In other words, uh, the miracle is the sign that tells people that so-and-so speaks for God. That's why if you look in the Bible, miracles aren't occurring all the time like you think they are. They're occurring in, in time periods when there's a new prophet that needs a new confirmation. There's a new message that needs a new miracle. There's a new sermon that needs a new sign. So miracles occur when God is doing them through people around Moses, Elijah and Elijah, and Jesus and the apostles. Those are the three great time periods of miracles. And if miracles occurred routinely all the time, A, we wouldn't consider them miraculous, and B, they wouldn't get our attention to show us that so-and-so speaks for God. I mean, the, the primary miracle in, the, in Christianity, of course, is the resurrection, right? Right. Imagine, Chris, if people rose from the dead routinely. What would the resurrection of Christ mean to us? Well, gee whiz. I mean, if, if, if John down the street resurrected, then what's the big deal that Jesus did it 2,000 years ago? Yeah. I mean, you go to somebody, you go, Jesus rose from the dead to prove he was God. And by trusting in him, you can have your sins forgiven. And the guy goes, so what? Uncle Leroy just rose from the dead two weeks ago. <laughs> you know, now I got to give the inheritance back. You know, no, no, it's got to be a rare event. And so miracles, if they occur, don't occur a lot. They're rare events. That's what a miracle is. And in the Bible, anyway, they're used to confirm a message from God. That's now, right. a lot of people don't believe in miracles uh, because they think they're incredible. How can we believe in miracles? And how can we believe in a resurrection or Jonah or Noah or any of these crazy things that appear to go on in the Old Testament? And I always ask people, what's the greatest miracle in the Bible? And sometimes they'll say Jonah or Noah or the resurrection. And actually, that's not true. The greatest miracle in the Bible is the first verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. If that verse is true, every other verse is at least possible, right? Absolutely. I mean, if God can create the whole universe out of nothing, can he resurrect Jesus from the dead? Yeah. Can he do Noah and Jonah and part the Red Sea and make axe heads float in water and walk on water? He can do any of that stuff. He can create the universe out of nothing. Well, the interesting thing, Chris, is we now even have atheists admitting the data for the first verse of the Bible. They're saying that, yeah, the universe had a beginning. They try and come up with another explanation other than God. They fail, but they try and say someone else did it or something else did it usually something else, but the, the logic seems inescapable to me. If space, time, and matter had a beginning, then it can't be a natural cause. It's got to be something beyond space, time, and matter that brought it into existence, yeah. and that's what we mean by God. So I don't have any problem believing in any miracle in the Bible if the first verse is true. In fact, one point I like to make, Chris, is this, that, and I know this sounds heretical for people out there who believe the Bible's inerrant, as I do, but I, I put it this way. Um, Christianity is not true because the Bible says it's true. In other words, Christianity is not true because a series of documents we put under one binding, we call the Bible says it's true. In fact, Christianity would be true if the Bible never existed. What? How can that be? Because Christianity did not originate with a book. Christianity originated with an event, the resurrection there would be no New Testament unless the resurrection occurred. Who is the New Testament written by? It's written by Jews, with the exception of Luke. He's the only Gentile. Why would Jews, who thought they were God's chosen people, invent or resurrected Jesus and then go die for it? Answer, they wouldn't. 
They already thought they're God's chosen people. The New Testament writers did not create the resurrection. The resurrection created the New Testament writers. I asked people, do you realize there were thousands of Christians before a line of the New Testament was ever written? Yeah, how or why? Because Jesus had resurrected from the dead. They didn't read it in a book. It happened, and then they later wrote it down. Amazing messages from three terrific individuals, all with such a big heart for God and for focusing on what matters most. Uh, you know, just living a life of service, having hope, and having a relationship with your Creator. We thank them all so much, and we look forward to having them back on the Strong by Design podcast soon. Thank you for joining us for this very special episode. We will be doing more of these. You have a blessed day. Thank you so much for listening to the Strong by Design podcast. If you found value in today's episode, please subscribe so that more people can find out about our show. Plus, you don't want to miss any future episodes with the amazing guests and topics we have lined up for you.